Hey, everybody. Welcome to Love and Reload, the voice of the relocation industry. I am your host, Ben Cross, and I'm so blessed and honored to be here today with Paula Caligiuri, CEO and founder of Skillify. We're going to be talking about cultural agility, getting into all things cultural and also global mobility. Paula, welcome to the show. It's great to be here, Ben. Thanks for having me. It's good to have you here with us. And where in the world are you, Paula? Right now, I'm in West Palm Beach, Florida, escaping the Boston winter. Escaping the Boston winter. There you go. Um, also, get in the comments right now. If you're watching this right now, I want to know who you are, where you are, and what you're up to today. Is it is it Boston winter where you are? Is it Florida spring? You know, Texas was weird today uh, here in Dallas. I, uh, I'm supposed to go to a Hawaiian-themed uh, happy hour for North Texas relocation professionals later. I'm supposed to wear a Hawaiian shirt, and there was flurries this morning. When I walked out of my house. So go figure, wow. Paula. <laughs> go you know? figure, right. I have climate agility around here. But really? uh, yeah, it's good to have you here, Paula. And we're talking about cultural agility. Paula, first off, as we let people kind of come in here, let them know, what is cultural agility? I'm sure, Ben. It, it's the ability for individuals to comfortably and effectively work in different countries but also with people from different cultures. So it's needed anytime you need to build trust, gain credibility, communicate, collaborate. It's an important construct. Why is it? So I get why it's important, like if I'm living somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. But why is it important for the workplace, the workforce? Right. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Like anytime we're demographically different from one another, um, we use our own lenses, the, the, the lenses that we've been raised with, right, to to perceive other people in the world around us. And so anytime we're demographically different from one another, there's a chance that we could be seeing something or each other differently or in a way that was unintended. So cultural agility is needed to inherently um, establish trust with one another and communicate and build credibility and all that other good stuff. And it's, it's needed even if you do nothing but work from home, but are, are, you know, in a remote setting. It's needed for all these. Yeah. I, I love that because I think we do, we assume that people see the world the way we see the world. Of course. Yeah. They absolutely. bring different experiences, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not just culture, right? We think about culture as our country that we're from. And that's not it, right? It's it's your your family, your faith that you've been raised in. It could be your education structure, your profession, your generation. That's a huge cultural difference. I assume everybody I meet is a Dallas Cowboys fan. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, why wouldn't they be? I don't know. Tandra For Chester, example. yeah, Tandra Chester checking in here from Decatur, Texas, in the house. What's up, Tandra? I bet she's a Cowboys fan. Never know. Adrian, check. I bet he's a Cowboys fan, right? Never know. Um, it's good to see y'all here. Hit that like button. Get in the comments. I want to know who you are, where you are. What are your thoughts on cultural agility? Have you felt culturally not agile before? Uh, what's that feeling like? Um, but but yeah, I, I like what you're saying here, Paula. Have you have you used this work with like like teams of people? I mean, wh where do you see companies really needing this this help? Oh, yeah. yeah, teams are teams are an important one. Um, certainly multicultural teams, we do a lot of work trying to just understand the, the difference in values across team members. And even if they're all demographically the same, there's still, again, those values that are different and that can affect teamwork. But we see it, we use this with pharmaceutical sales reps who are selling to diverse healthcare providers. I work with um, police forces that are working with oh, wow. and serving communities that are of different um, backgrounds we work with, uh, professional athletes. I mean, it's really right. any situation where you're working collaboratively with somebody who's of a different, of a different culture. That's when this, this is needed. So here, me and Tandra both live in, in the great state of Texas. And I assume she's a Dallas Cowboys fan and she's not, she's a Seahawks fan. Oh, there right. you go. <laughs> so there we go. Right, right off the bat. I assumed incorrectly. You know what they say about assumptions? Hey, Annie, checking in from Glomo HQ. What's up, Annie? Good to see you. Thanks for checking in. Hit that like button. Get in the comments. I want to know what your thoughts are around culture and teams and, and global mobility as, as we look at that. But, you know, you talk about, you know, policing. You talk about um, 
sports teams. I mean, these are kind of these are interesting to me. I mean, what are some of like the are, are you able are you allowed to share some examples of some of the stuff you've done in those areas? Yeah, well, I think we could it's probably easiest to share sort of broadly maybe what kind of what some of the challenges are and I can use some police examples. So, if you think about what happens when you go into a situation that's of kind of a demographically different or culturally diverse situation, there's kind of three approaches that you could take, right? You could say, look it, I've got to adapt. I've got to fully adapt to the situation that I'm in. That's yeah. one way, that's adaptation. But another way is saying, no, 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 I've got to hold the standard of whatever situation I'm in. It could be if you're in a corporate environment, it could be your ethics, it could be quality, it could be safety, whatever it might be. But then there's this third approach, which is integration. It's saying, look, it's not going to be my way. It's not going to be your way. We're going to come up with a way that's going to kind of work for both of us. So whether it's, you know, in the police work, right? Sometimes there's situations where it's a whole lot of non-negotiable. Law is the law, right? But there might be cultural, culturally appropriate ways to use cultural minimization. So, so I, I like these three examples you yeah. gave. So the first one being totally assimilate to the situation. Okay. The other being like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to uphold my, what I, what I think and believe in my experiences are correct and the standard. And I'm going to impose that on the situation. And then the third, it seems like is kind of the right answer where it's like, we're going to compromise a little bit here. No, oh, no. no. It's not the right answer. I'm no. already getting it wrong. I'm five minutes in. I'm getting it wrong. Ding, 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 right? So, so no, in fact, what we found across professions is that what the people who are the most culturally agile know when to pull which of those three levers. So, for instance, what we find is that if you're a sales rep, the more you can adapt to the expectation of your client, the better it is. Remember, it's like what's hitting their brains and what are they perceiving of you um, in situations of, of like ethics or, um, or you know quality or safety those are a whole lot of non-negotiables so it's could it could mean persuasion and motivation to convince someone to do it in a way that they're not comfortable with or not the one that they're most familiar with but it's needed and then that integration we find most often in situations of teams of groups of mm -hmm. you know that, that's kind of used in sort of what a lot of people think of like you said you know is that the that's kind of the quote unquote right way, but actually it's not. It's each of those have like different levers. And what we found is that is that among our clients, really great culturally agile individuals are able to know when, when to pull each of those levers. And those individuals have some characteristics about them that, um, that make them great at this. This is really interesting. When you explain it like that, it makes perfect sense. Salespeople have to mirror the customer and, and, and kind of identify with the customer, build trust that way. Safety, you're right. Safety or, I mean, yeah, non-negotiables. And then the teams cross-functionally. I mean, that makes perfect sense. I, I love the way you explained it here. We've got, I've got questions here, but we, we've got some comments coming in. Get in the, in the chat here. If you've got comments, bring them in. Uh, also hit that like button right now. Monica is saying, I'm a foreign national working in corporate environment in the U.S. and don't believe any of my bosses in the past thought of understanding my culture to give me feedback, for example, accordingly. Do you encounter this? Of course. I, that, that's actually one of the feedback is one of the um, thorniest ones because some people, if they're not given, if they're socialized to be very direct and they don't receive direct feedback, they're not hearing feedback. And other people who are a bit more indirect or have that high context speech, if they hear direct feedback, all they do is they think that sounds very rude and very like very confrontational. So how do we know if we're supervisors, how do we know what the right style is? Yeah. So there's lots of different ways to tell. Sometimes it's just asking, hey, look at I'd like, I'd like to share some some thoughts on, on your work product or on the 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 job you just did. Um, what would be the best way to, to share that with you? I mean, like that's that's kind of like the, the the soft pitch way if it's not a big thing. We do a lot of work where we have um, groups kind of look at each other's work values and identify kind of in a general sense. Um, okay, for those of you who are more indirect, here's how we'd like to share feedback. Does that sound right for you? For those of you who are more direct, and then people can can sort of identify if they would like 
of how they would like their, their feedback received. But feedback is a, is a tough one because, because boy, it can, it can um, turn some relationships, you know, it can make a few relationships go south if you know. Yeah, I feel like that is a dicey one. Because, and I feel like when you ask people, people say, hey, listen, just be straight with me. Yeah. Just tell me the way it is. I just, I just don't, don't beat around the bush. Just tell me. And then, but sometimes they don't really mean that. Like sometimes people don't know what they need, like what they need or what they like or how they, what their preferences are. They think it's one way, but the, they, they respond differently to it. I, I don't know if you've ever seen that or not, but I mean, do you come, do you come across that? Oh, know. sure. We do all the time. So like I so said, we do a lot of this um, mapping of groups. So whether it's small teams or, or bigger units, where they can look at their values on a matrix, essentially. And you can see that, that there's individuals across the continuum on things like, you know, their communication style or their level of formality or their level of, you know, deference to hierarchy or they're like all these different dimensions that are critical. But when you sort of assume that everybody's in one direction, right. a lot is missed. So it's, it's if, if nothing else, it's great for a leader to just see it in a snapshot and to be able to say, okay, I've got variance in my team in terms of how, if I'm being perceived as a buddy or if I'm being perceived as a leader. And sometimes I have to be careful. I can't be too buddy buddy with those who think, who want to really almost put me in that, that, um, that position of deference. And for some, you know, expecting that I'm there is, is really not going to work because we're more egalitarian. It. So, so it's just, it's helpful to know information is nothing but good at this point. <laughs> so you measure these, these types of dimensions for we your do. clients. We do. Yeah, we do it. Um, as long per, at the team level. So we're talking about teams right now at the team level. Um, we do this as long as the team is of five individuals or more. Um, okay. it, it maps out on an anonymous grid. Um, and it's, it's, it's really, really just a cool tool. Um, nice way to, nice way to, uh, Kind of understand the group and then the group can use it themselves we do a lot of workshopping with with groups being able to say okay if this is us anonymously how do we want to work together like what's the best way to to interact with one another and, and then do they keep like a, like kind of a cheat sheet like okay i've got monica over here and she likes this and i got steve and he likes that and like <laughs> that kind of that's how i would do it. i'd be like i would like okay i gotta tell monica to stop doing this how do i say it like <laughs> yeah she's the one well we, it's anonymous but but it's really kind of we we try to make it less about i'm this way therefore and it's more about hey look at you guys we're all different we're we're just we're different here you know we've been socialized differently so what a really fun kind of way to start is that, say, you know, if anyone wants to share wh why they ended up like at one end of the continuum or at the other. And it's really fascinating listening to people explain like, oh, I, I'm really um, group oriented because I grew up in a rural community and everybody helped everyone. And I was related to the, you know, my my family all lived within a two mile radius and and then, or they'll explain, oh, yeah, I was in a military family. I've really fixed time. And, you know, we were always socialized to be always on time and da, 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 da. And, and they, everybody gets it. So once you sort of take it out of you're of this group, therefore you are and take it in, right. this is just me. This is my narrative. Yeah. And all of a sudden there's receptivity to, to understanding that. Difference. I, I really love that. Uh, get in the comments, hit that like button. Uh, there's a whole bunch of people watching on LinkedIn on uh facebook check in with us let us know who you are where you're at just check in if you've got questions for paula about cultural agility if you've got situations or hypotheticals or asking for a friend that's <laughs> our, it's a safe place right now for questions um throw them in there i appreciate you monica getting in the in the questions breaking the ice for us a little bit um while those questions come in and people think a little bit about their own cultural situations with teams in the workplace or in other countries in global mobility context. We're going to talk about global mobility and we're going to talk about strategies here in a bit. I want to ask you personally, Paula, why is this an area? Why, why cultural agility for you? Yeah. So, so I, I, I mean, my story is, um, I don't know if it's terribly interesting or not, but I was studying abroad in 1987. I was in Rome. I'm originally from Buffalo, New York. And, Hey, shout, out, shout out New York. I, I grew up in White Plains. I went to school in, in Albany. So, oh, you know, so you understand snow too. I, I get you. Yeah. Not like <laughs> Buffalo snow where you're on the, you're on Lake Erie and you're just getting it, but yeah, we, we get snow. Yeah. Yeah. Snow belt. Well, so he's okay. So, so I'm in the snow belt 
went over to Rome, Italy, 87. But but that was when um, that was the fall of 1987, when the market crashed and, you know, the money I had saved up wasn't worth anything. Called home. Mom and dad said, honey, you've got two choices. You can either come home or get a job. So all the other American kids who were pretty wealthy, I wasn't at all. Um, they were all running around and, and, you know, they were able to kind of run around Europe. I was kind of, quote unquote, stuck back in Rome. So I just had to make Italian friends. I had Italian boyfriend. I spent down some time in Southern Italy with my family. Um, my parents are, are Southern Italian. So it was a really different experience. When I returned back to Buffalo, was finishing up my junior year of college, my advisors said, hey, Paula, you know, something's wrong with you. You seem mopey, sad, depressed. Everything we know now as repatriation adjustment. But back then, I'm like, I don't know. I just don't feel like myself anymore. I feel different. I feel this. I feel like things that I'm sure everybody can. Yeah. We, we also call that like reverse culture shock. Where exactly. You experience exactly. When you come home. Yeah. So they said they said very intelligently, if this had such a profound effect on you, why don't you study it? So this was the 80s. This was this was kind of wide open space for psychologists. So I. For my PhD application, I said, I want to study what makes people effective living and working internationally. And I want to know how they change from deep developmental cross-cultural experiences. And I joke that 30 something years later, I'm still studying what makes people effective living and working internationally and how they change from deep developmental cross-cultural situations. So that, that's actually the story of how I got into it. Um, but, you know, era of globalization began in the late 80s. Everything kind of mushroomed out really quickly for me. Um, and so I've always been kind of one hand in on the research side and then the other hand on the consulting side. Yeah, it's really interesting. And we are in a, it, what feels like a very globalized world, although it does also feel like people are trying to change that a little bit and kind of go, mm -hmm. go back, right. And be kind of more, more nationalist. Right. But uh, it, it is, argue, you know, we can't argue with the fact that we're very globalized and, and we look at the impact that, that the migration has had on the world. Um, I mean, gosh, even, even recently, right? I mean, tons of migration going on and people migrating for all sorts of reasons and, and continuing to do so and just, and just growing. So, I mean, what a, what a cool thing to study. I'm curious though, cause you've, you've looked at it now over, over a few decades now. Mm -hmm. And do you feel like people from a psych psychology standpoint, do you feel like people's, ability to adapt is because are, are people becoming more adaptable or or less adaptable in your opinion i'm really yeah. curious about that I, you know truthfully ben it's it's about the same you know we as humans you know we are we haven't evolved cognitively as fast as as we i wish we would have right you know we are still in a sense um you know creatures, mammals who are experiencing novelty in the same way, you know, anytime we're in situations of novelty, certain things happen to us, right? It's fundamentally, the way our bodies handle serotonin and dopamine, which sounds a little like a little creepy, but it, it very much affects our ability to be in situations of novelty. So in a mobility, you know, from that perspective, you think about you taking someone from a situation of comfort, a situation mm -hmm. that they know, and you're picking them up and putting them in another country or another location it's new and novel what happens to them well we know their cortisol goes up we know like we know there are certain things that will be inherent among a human that just happens when this is our evolutionary psychology this is just happens when we're, we're in that that state of novelty and what we found is that so this really hasn't changed over the decades right not enough time for evolution to occur occur but that some people are better better at it than others um, naturally. Yet what we have learned in these decades is that we now know how to help people become better at it. So so that that's been I think maybe the biggest change over the years is that we can help be, people build these cultural agility competencies. But well, and that's kind of where I was thinking too, right? I mean, not from an evolutionary, and I've never and I love the fact you're describing this like physiologically cortisol level of serotonin. I mean, I think that's really interesting. And in, in all my years of talking about global mobility, I've never heard people really discuss the physiology of it in the way that you're talking about it. So that's really super interesting to me. I, I guess my, my question though is, 
is you know with the advent of social media and technology and the different tools that we have is it changing the way and maybe these are more strategies and tactics right but like is it changing the way that we deal with the way that we deal with new cultures and and the feeling of not being and the novelty of it all yeah yeah there's a there's a yes and no part right so so no, because if you're working, you know, if you're out of your home office and you have a, a meeting with someone in another country, you're surrounded by comfort, right? This is just so naturally you. But yes, and that the same challenges one would have in a multicultural setting aren't going away just because you're not being raised to the, like your, your antenna aren't up that you're in a novel situation. So in many respects, you know, we, we kind of are, are forgetting that these cultural differences are still present. And, and unfortunately, you know, we're investing a lot in collaborative technologies, which are great. And they're, they're saving a lot of people, you know, airplane time. But at the same time, it's that airplane time that makes us remember that we're in a culturally novel situation. So um, I'm spending a lot of time these days with clients just helping with, you know, cross couple cultural collaboration on virtual teams, call it cross-cultural collaborations on, you know, Zoom meetings and things like that. Yeah, really interesting. And get in the comments, hit that like button, want to know what you think as well. We've got people checking in here. Keep checking in, want to hear from you. Um, so what types of strategies can people use when they find themselves, okay, here, I've, I'm, I'm an expat somewhere. What types of, of strategies should they be using? Yeah. So there's there's always there's always going to be two parts of this that help people become great wherever they are. You know, one part of this is what they're aware of, like what do they know about the context that they're in? So it's not necessarily what will be different because it's stereotyping, but it's what could be different so that your 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 brain, unless you're ready to see something that's different, you won't see it. I mean, it's just how we're that's how we are. Our brains are inherently lazy. And unless we think there, there could be something different. We're, we're going to miss it. So, so, so yes. we really have to prepare our brain. We have to be exactly. looking for it. Exactly. Exactly. So there's, it's like that. I don't know if you remember that, that old um, selective perception study where they showed the, the bear walking through the, the middle yes. of the, yes. Everybody Did anyone was, see the bear? And like, what are you talking exactly, about? They showed what it bear? Again. And then when they showed it again, you're like, the bears are like, that's not the same video. That's yeah, exactly, yeah. it's exactly why this cross-cultural training works and it doesn't have to be elaborate it doesn't have to be forever it can be we do a lot of just online training it's just enough to be able to say hey you might see a moonwalking bear or whatever yeah. <laughs> and, and then in, in in which case you know if it's there you will if not you're not going to start hallucinating things that aren't there it's just not how it works our brains are pretty good at this so that's one side of it the other side of it is is the competencies that you can start working on even before you're in a new a new place, things like your tolerance of ambiguity, your perspective taking, your humility, your relationship building, your curiosity, all of these things kind of come together and they form your cultural agility. And we know that that, that, that those are super critical. Um, so these are asked. So I want to just highlight this for a second. So you're are, are you saying that people who are culturally agile have the have high index high in curiosity and and what were some of the other ones that, that yeah you know? there there's six of them so uh curiosity you mentioned is one um tolerance of ambiguity resilience the idea that you know new and novel situations are going to knock you off your your game and our brains are inherently lazy so when, whenever we're under stress we move to comfort that's the most natural thing in the world it's why there's comfort food in our country it's why expat enclaves you know, are, are comfortable, right? So, so we, brains under stress, move to comfort. So that's why things like resilience and, and tolerance of ambiguity are really important. Um, curiosity, relationship building, because we learn about an environment from people who want to help us and teach us. Um, things like your humility, your ability to say, look at, I'm really good at whatever. I'm an engineer, I'm a journalist, I'm a whatever, but I don't know how to do that here so it's the ability to sort of slow down and say you know what i i'm not i'm not thinking any less of my skills i just have to learn how to make those skills put those skills in action here um 
And then of course, perspective taking, the ability to even see that someone else could be seeing the exact same thing differently. I love you said the the humility aspect. It's such an interesting, interesting call out there because people who are on assignment in another country are almost always super high potential, super high performing kind of people, right? Engineer, you know, whatever, right? Top, top, you know, really great, really educated a lot of times. And they're super smart in their home country, in their home environment. And then they go over to another country and somebody was describing this to me and they may not even be literate, right? And so you go from being like, smartest and i mean i you know i'm using the word smart i know there's a lot of bias around that right but smartest person in the room over here and then you go over here and you're and you're barely literate you can't speak the language can't order groceries ask where the bathroom is etc right i mean worst case scenario right um right. obviously a lot of people are prepared for these situations but if you're not right and and that's and that's got to feel that's got to be crazy that's got to be crazy that's got to feel really really wild you know how do you prepare somebody for that yeah, ex- exactly that, right? You prepare them for not being, it's, it's similar to, um, you know, for the first time people feeling their skin who have never been the only, you know, I remember years ago, I used to do these set- sessions in, on um, just for expats and people would come up to me and say, wow, you know, Paul, it's the first time in my life I'm a Caucasian male. It's the first time in my life I felt my skin. I was working in Japan. I was working in India. I was working like it was the first time. I, I felt like I stood out. And, and even that is kind of like, you have to prepare people for, for that. The, the truth is that people who are naturally high in humility, they get it. They totally get it. And it's not just, it's not like this bowing and scraping, oh, help me, help me. It's, it's more of the just saying, hey man, I, I, wanna be, I wanna be effective at this presentation yeah. that I have to give tomorrow. Um, normally this is my style. What do you think would work well here? And, and people who are, they, they really do want to help. So it's not, it's not like, uh, it's not denigrating your, your expertise. It's just helping really smart people realize that they can be really smart and really effective if they understand the situations that they're in. It's so critical for expats. We've dedicated like a whole like segment just to, um, of our business, just to helping expats, um, become effective at this. And then, again, there's skills that they can learn before they even go anywhere, but you can certainly learn them while they're there as well. And I want to talk about your company, Skillify, because you are mm-hmm. the founder of it and, and I want to learn more about it. We got a comment coming in. Get in the comments. I want to hear what your thoughts are about cultural agility. If you got questions for Paula, let us know. Hit that like button. Ponic is saying it's a great topic for global mobility. We work with people all over the globe. We collaborate with co- corporations and contacts from various countries i found my relationships more successful when i tried to approach people looking at their culture and also as individuals to understand what drove their behavior or attitude yeah that's cool and that's that curiosity you're talking about and that humility as well absolutely it's all of them it's all of them yeah super yeah. cool what's up jill we got non checking in as competitive as all of us oftentimes the pressure is internal it was hard for me to accept how long it took me for me to adopt to a new environment. Can't accept my own pace. Interesting. And Nod's a third third culture kid. Um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, do you find that too? I mean, going back to the, the profile of these expats, I mean, at least the ones that are relocated, right? A lot of times they're super high performers and they want to be good immediately. I mean, that's how they got where they are, right? Super, a lot of pressure on themselves. How do, you, how do you tell them like, oh, chill, like, let it, you know, work, work towards it, but. Yeah. Yeah. And we can, I mean, there, again, there's the things we can do to prep people and the more they, they sincerely just, first of all, the more they understand that this could be different and the more they understand that that context matters, they really do want to be successful and they'll put a little time into both that awareness side and also the, the uh, cultural competence side. So both of them are critical, um, both meaningful and, 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 most people want to want to be successful, like you said. So they're they're willing to take the time to do it. So talk to us about Skillify. So you're the founder and CEO of Skillify. What what's Skillify? I'm actually the co-founder. We have um, co-founder. 
actually. Yeah, yeah, with Andy Palmer. Um, he was the co-founder and also the angel investor in Skillify. We're a public benefit corporation, Ben, which is, is an interesting designation because it means that part of our charter as a corporation is to do things for the greater good. So uh, we basically give a lot of things away for free. A lot of what I've just mentioned about the, you know, assessing your values on the awareness side and also assessing competencies, that's free. Um, we oh. put it out. We put it out there for free. It's at, on a tool called My Guide. It's M Y G I I D E. If anyone's interested, it's double I. So um, the, I want I want to call that out real quick. And, and can we put that in the in the comments too? It's it's uh, uh, spell it one more time for us, Paula. Sure. It's M Y G I I D E. Okay. M Y uh, M is in Mary. M Y G I I D E. Yeah, myguide.com. And you can go on and you'll see there's a there's a track for if I'm going to be working in another country or living working in another country, there's a track for I'm just curious. There's a track, like there's all these different, you know, tracks that you can take. Um, but there's you can get a lot of information for free. Um, and that was again always part That's of awesome. our charter at Skillify. Um, yeah, so it's it's been it's been great. We're we're fairly new as an organization. Um, we're doing for free what a lot of companies are charging for, and but we're doing it, I'm, I'm an academic, I don't know if um, you mentioned that, Ben, but I'm a university professor at uh, Northeastern. And so all of my career has been research-based and I'm, I'm kind of don't put anything out there until it's, it's, it's tested, road tested, academically tested, you know, but also, um, yeah. Things that have great have had great success. Yeah, there's a lot more rigor than uh, than what we what we use out here in the regular old corporate space. Yeah, no, we appreciate that. This sounds like a really cool cool tool here. And and what made you give it a give it away for free? I mean, that's uh, that's pretty nice of you. Yeah, that that actually is a function of Andy. <laughs> But Andy, think, what are you doing? Give it away the, the goods here, Andy. <laughs> well, actually, he knew me really well. He goes, Paula, you're way too much of an academic. You're gonna you're gonna want to give stuff away for free anyhow, because that's what we do, right? Academics create and disseminate knowledge. Um, but his also, he said, you know what, this is just too important. He's he's a serial investor, he's had um like four or five unicorns already in his own in his portfolio. He's has funded or founded, I think, 120 firms, done really well. And he's look at for, he's at the you know grandkids phase of life. He said, if I can make this world even a little bit better in terms of cultural agility for my grandchildren, I'm all in. Like I, I wanna I wanna do this. So he's the one who helped us build my guide. Um, he's a, he's a tech CEO, and uh, he's been great at advising it. We're in the process of putting a little like a little bot on it so that people can ask it natural language questions and. You know, it's been it's 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 a really cool it's a cool tool, and a lot of it, like I said, is is available for free. Yeah, we've got. I mean, we've got tens of thousands of people using it all around the world. Wow, wow, and and when did uh, so tell me how you, how you ended up starting Skillify though? Because, uh, well, you and Andy started. Skillify. Yeah, so it was a conversation. Um, he and I were having God in twenty in 21 and it back then I, I had some assessment tools that I was selling like I was, I was still I had still been consulting I've been consulting for years um, I have a tool called sage that's used uh, quite a bit in global mobility and he was the one that said that back then he said Paul this is this is just way too important for for you to passively wait for clients to come to you um, let's just put it out there let's just put it out there so did the consulting just you know, get it out there in a bigger way. And so he's, he's the one who, who funded the, the build of the, of the online assessment tools and the, the interactive and the, you know, it's, it's, a, it's cool. It's fun. It's fun to play around with. And you mentioned, you said 10,000 people are using this. Oh gosh. Yeah. At least. And no, I've been like tens of thousands. Of tens people. of thousands. Yeah. And, and what type, what types of people, you know, use, use these tools and, and kind of who is that, who is that customer? What is that profile? Yeah, so we have a lot of, um, gosh, because we, we, again, we segment the groups, right? So we have a track for students, so students who are studying abroad, international students, there's, there's a, a, a lot of them. Um, we have a lot of corporate 
individuals who are just working in, in a multicultural reality. We have a lot of expats who are on there for the global mobility track. Um, just because of the numbers, they tend to be the like a smaller group, but proportionally that it's, you know, they're all kind of all using it at the same, at the same rate. Um, yeah. It's, and it's being used all over the world. Well, wow, that's really, that's really impressive. Let me ask you this. I want you to kind of, you know, you're, you're an academic, you, you've been in that space for a long time. You're also have this really cool company, Skillify. You're one of the smartest people I've, I've talked to about this, um, especially with the rigor that you approach it with. The rest of us are just making this up. So we've actually studied this. Um, my question, though, is kind of about the about the future and about trends. You know, work from home and, and remote work is, un, I mean, there's been a shift. How does that impact the need for global mobility, in your opinion? Yeah, I have a feeling we're still we're still swinging in the one direction, you know, in terms of the companies are going to save money. They're still going to kind of pull back assignments. But but I've watched this swing before. You know, I've, I've watched this swing a few times and, and I have a feeling what's going to start to happen is that the companies that, are, that go back to um, using global mobility, especially for those critical roles of strategic roles where trust is needed, where um, we really do need individuals to be bridges from unit to unit or subsidiary to subsidiary or headquarters, whatever, we're going to see that start to swing back again. Um, and, and there's going to be more of a movement. What I'd, I'd love to see, and I've been saying this for decades, is, you know, mobile, global, I can't even say it now, global mobility is such a technical function. I mean, just with the immigration and the, you know, comp and taxation, there's so much involved in a technical function. There's one piece I'd almost like to layer onto that because the global mobility folks are doing so much. But if they were more involved in the strategic talent development side of it, I think companies would start to see a much greater use of um, mobility for the purpose of talent development. You know, right now it's very much structural. We need somebody to go from a small market to a larger market, developing developed countries, whatever it might be. But now, now I think we're going to start to see um, much more of that of that strategic intent. Like what can somebody gain from being there as well as what can they do while being there? Yeah. What do you, I mean, ex expound on that a little bit more here. I mean, sure. what you seem to suggest here is like almost like global mobility for its, like for its own sake, like for its intrinsic value. Uh, what are your thoughts there about, is there a business case for that? I mean, it costs a lot of money. <laughs> it costs a lot of money, but wow. One person doing it really well can can make a unit incredibly effective or make a rollout, you know, seem like, like they're so good at what they do. So, so yeah, when done well, the skills gained in the experience um, can in fact build that pipeline of culturally agile talent. It can help the company do really well going forward. Um, I think what we're going to start to see more of is so, so I remember, okay, I'll, let me just back this one, back this up with a story. I remember post 9-11, and I'm sure you did too, Ben, with the, um, when companies put that moratorium on global assignments. And I remember getting pulled into um, a meeting with the conference board, and it was a group of talent development people. And they basically gave me, said, okay, Paul, you, you're an expert in expat stuff. What, like, what do we do? We can't send anyone abroad right now. Now what? Now what do we do? To, to build this. And oh, by the way, how long does it take? And how long, like, you know what I mean? So it was very like, structural. It's not like, so this belief was you pick someone up from one country and you put them in another country and then fairy dust drops over them and they become culturally agile. So all of the research since 2001 kind of pivoted over to, okay, well, what do we have to do while someone is in a country in order for them to build cultural agility? And the rea reality is what we found and I've done a lot of research on this. It's just, it's not about the duration of time that someone's there. It's about the quality of the experience. So wow. I've, I've been able to show that we can have these really short-term experiences that are incredibly developmental, that have a permanent increase in individuals' cultural agility competencies. So we can we can benefit like on the cost side if we if we kind of spend a little more time on the you know 
structuring the experience. So you can shorten the experience, but deep shorten the assignment, but deepen the experience exactly. to be more transformative. That's really interesting. Is there a minimum amount of time though, in your opinion that, I mean, it has to be at least. <laughs> yeah. Right. No, I mean, I think it's the amount of time it takes. Maybe like an overnight in Tokyo. It's gotta yeah, be like right. at it's least, like, you know, just one little night at the Hilton and wherever, <laughs> and therefore you've got it. No, I mean, if, if that's all it took, I, you know, I, we'd be sending everyone on a cruise or something. And no, it, you, you need time in order to be able to sense and feel um, your assumptions, to be able to have some of those questioned and tested, to start to realize that there's different approaches, to kind of have those lightning, lightning, or to those light bulbs go off where you see the uh, what could be different, that starts to, to be really beneficial. I wanna ask you, so we're kind of, we're, we're, our curiosity has peaked here a little bit. Um, and we've got some really cool free tools here, but but maybe what's what's one piece of advice or one place to start for professionals out there that want to become more culturally agile? Yeah, I would say, I mean, some really simple things that I do with my executives, as well as I do that with my um, my undergraduates who are learning this stuff as well. I mean, it's the exact same it's the exact same advice because we're humans in situations of novelty. Um, things like practicing mindfulness, and I know that's so, sort of like kind of boring at this point to talk about, but the idea that you can really go into a situation and and observe it and experience it and, and really kind of take in all the sensation without rushing to judgment. So our brains naturally, our brains are lazy. They want to rush to judgment, but to train your brain to slow things down and just observe. So that's actually a really great strategy for everyone at any stage of their careers is that mind practicing mindfulness. Um, the other one I recommend is to sort of kind of reset the bar for curiosity and asking more questions. So some people have kind of a natural limit and they we want to kind of raise the bar on questions because um, that helps them understand the context that they're in. Yeah, those would be kind of two really simple places to start. They don't cost these are, too many. These are things I feel like I need to work on, like not rushing to judgment, you know, slow it down. Don't, you know, don't assume. Right. Cause I mean, you know, as a, as a CEO, as a, you know, as a busy person, I mean, here's the thing, we're all busy. It doesn't matter what your job is. We're all busy. Right. And yeah. we do tend to, to rush and take shortcuts. I, I, I like, the, I like some of the things you're saying, like, you know, our brains are lazy. Right. And we're all humans. Uh, you know, what do you, what do you say? Dealing with novel experiences or something, experiencing novelty. Yeah. We're our bodies from an evolutionary perspective. Remember, novel, novelty was bad back in the day, right? <laughs> right? Novelty could mean, you know, saber-toothed tiger about to eat us. Like that, that's just what our brains still, you know, say, hey, look at when, when things are novel, I have to be on high alert. This is new. You could be having a great time, but it's still, it still raises, you know, cortisol and, and all that other good stuff. So you're still on high alert. And when our bodies are under sort of this, in this state, we always try to move to kind of quick judgment to preserve um, energy. And we tend to seek comfort. So that kind of like we make quick decisions and we look for people who are similar. It's the exact opposite of what you need to be it's doing. So, it's so true though. When you say make quick decisions and look for people that are similar, when, so, so we go to a lot of conferences, right? And it's pretty neat to study people in these, I say study, I shouldn't say study to you. You actually do study things. I just <laughs> make observations over a beer. So, but you walk into this room and, and people do, they, they, they cluster, right? So you, you make a quick decision. You walk in this room full of people, feels like high school, and you make a quick decision to, to, to not be standing there alone. It's like find somebody, you know, and you end up, you know, clustering, right? And you look at the clusters, the men are clustering together. The women are clustering together. The, the, you know, people are usually of a similar kind of you know, socio yeah, twenty somethings are yeah. together. The twenties, yeah, are exactly. Together. The generations are together. Yeah. You know, I, we have we have you know black folks on our show. They're like, yeah, I remember being the only black person in the room. I saw somebody look like me. I, I went across the room, and and now now we're at least we're not alone, right? And and you and you start to do that, right? I even I even notice. I don't have you ever noticed. You sit down at a table, like maybe it's a banquet table or it's like a big table, a conference room table or something. I've even noticed lately that. The when you look at the table after everyone's seated, more times than not, I've noticed the the men are kind of like on one side or like one area or like in a row, and the women are kind of on one. And and generally, I don't know. Have you noticed that or or not? 
Am I crazy? It's, it's the most natural thing in the world. And it's not racism. It's not sexism. It's not xenophobia. It's not ageism. It's not anything other than our brains in situations of novelty seek comfort. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I don't mean to like lighten this. It, right. Um, we can override it. We're also human and we're cognitively, you know, we're thinking creatures. If all we do is take a beat, slow it down and say, wait a minute, I might have more in common with the, I'm a 56 year old woman. I might have more in common with the 24 year old over there than I do with the other 56 year old women. You know what I mean? So, so, so it's okay to slow it down and, and, you know, give ourselves a chance to be a little uncomfortable, but that's where the tolerance, ambiguity and resilience kick in. Yeah. So how does this impact? So how does this play into like DE and I? Right? We we always we're talking about DE and I so much. Yeah. Right now, how does this how does this cultural agility play into DE and I? Oh, it's such a tough it's a tough question for me to answer, Ben, and I'm happy to do it because I think it's really important. I am extremely concerned with the past few years that we've just seen this massive proliferation of unconscious bias training, implicit bias training. And all that's done is introduced us all to our limbic systems. Basically is saying, hey, look, at congratulations, you have a functioning brain. Your functioning brain, for however old you are, has been storing data and makes instinctive judgments based on stored data. That's all that is. But we are not our limbic systems. We think we have our, our prefrontal cortex. We're really smart <laughs> in that we can use those brains of ours to go into situations and actually slow down cognition and, and, and and have like really cool interactions with one another. What makes me concerned, and sorry, the reason for the concern with DEI is that we're not doing cultural agility training, which is the slowing your brain down stuff. We're doing this unconscious bias training, which is basically introducing everyone to this concept of thinking that they're biased. Well, most of us aren't inherently biased. We, again, just have these functioning brains. So, but what ends up happening? Now that I know I've got a bias, I don't want my bias flags flying. So I'm going to start, you know, I'm going to avoid conversations, more naturally occurring conversations with people who are demographically different. Cause I don't want, I don't want anyone to see my bias that now I've been told I have. Um, so, so it's actually, yeah, not helping anyone out. I think we really do need to sort of slow that project down, kind of back off of the unconscious bias training and instead talk about this cultural agility training, understand the two sides, understand what could be different, but also build the competencies so you know how to handle those differences. Yeah, I think you bring up some really some really interesting points. And, and I, I think it's really interesting the way that you talk about the, the brain is just has a lot of data stored over time. Now it's making very fast decisions based on all the data that it has in there. Um, but I mean, isn't, isn't in some ways that the same as bias, like that data the, the tendency for that data to to to, to make yeah, I just wish they wouldn't have called it bias because by by sharing it that and we're all it. like a function of our our quote unquote bias. It's not. It's just your it's your it's your limbic system trying to read an environment to keep us safe. Mm -hmm. But but that's that's a primitive part of our brain. We're not that. We're we're cognitively evolved in that we we have a prefrontal cortex that that yeah. functions for most of us. <laughs> And that we can slow things down. And if we if we train ourselves to understand, to read the environment and respond, um, we actually can can just connect with people. One of the best things that I always train my like these usually with my master's students, my MBA students, my undergraduate students, is to really quickly find similarity with another person. And it could be anything. You you mentioned Dallas Cowboys, you Dallas know, Cowboys, Cowboys. which usually is more of a divisive topic, frankly, than a conciliatory topic but yes yeah yeah i like it yeah i love a, a love of american football it yes. could be oh i like your watch it could be you know mm. nice handbag it, whatever it might be because our brains are, our brains are sort of indiscriminate when it comes to any similarity that it believes it sees it connects to and it could be anything you may hey i'm a new yorker oh so am i oh yeah well wow, so yeah well you know it anything really anything our brains as soon as we believe ourselves that we've found similarity it sort of gives us a little it frees up a little bit of bandwidth to relax into a conversation um, that's that's more natural i love it i absolutely love it and speaking of natural conversations i want to pivot this conversation into something uh a fun little game okay fun game? Fun. Right. i like games all right let's, let's play games 
Um, hit that like button. Get in the comments. I want to hear from you. What do you think about cultural agility? And also, we're going to play overrated, underrated. So that's something we like to do at the end of uh, every show is play overrated, underrated, okay? This game is uh, two rules. All right, it's my game, so I set the rules. It's my game. So okay. uh, the first the first rule is I'm going to give you a topic, and you are going to tell me if that topic is overrated or underrated. With that okay, theme. overrated or underrated. Okay. Yep. Okay, got pretty, it. pretty straightforward. And the second, because it's mine, show and my uh, rules, is I get to tell you if you are right or wrong. <laughs> yeah. So you 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 get the joke. Okay, good. All right, here we go. Uh, overrated, underrated. The first one up is long tenure in a job. Now, this is an interesting one because we also do recruitment. So I'm very fascinated to hear what you think. Overrated, underrated, long tenure. Overrated. Most people, uh, most people build the skills that they need um, after some period of time and then kind of get stuck in a job. So long tenured in any one role is, uh, yeah, overrated. You know what? You are absolutely correct. You are absolutely correct. I see this all the time. I mean, you know, as as recruiters, we're, we're hypersensitive to short tenure, right? Job hoppers, ooh, you know, oh, they're job hoppers. They can't commit, you know, whatever. Something's wrong with them. Um, but too long can be bad too, you know? And uh, I think you're hundred. What is, let me ask you, what is too long? When you've stopped learning. I just, I just wrote a book, actually Andy Palmer, my, my co-founder and I just wrote a book called uh, live for a living. And we talk about basically owning your own career and, and, you know, having some agency over your career moves. And that's kind of it. You know, if you know where you want to go, where you want to take your career, once you're no longer, building and growing and moving toward what you want to be doing you've, you're staying too long and if you've asked for other opportunities and you're not getting them it's time to move what a great way to put it i usually get that itch around like three and a half years and by you know four and a half i'm, I'm you know i was i was gone typically um mm -hmm. so wow really cool great uh all right next one sleep overrated or underrated <laughs> It's, you're out there hustling. Underrated. You're on the circuit out there working out in West Palm. You're not sleeping. I love my sleep. I wear my aura ring. I am like the, I am a sleep diva. I think sleep is so important. Sleep mask, darkening shades, all of it. We all need so sleep. sleep. So then is it fair to say sleep is underrated? <laughs> sleep is underrated. Yeah. Sleep is <laughs> underrated. Okay. Underrated. I'm going to ask you again, how much sleep though are we talking about? So I, my understanding is that humans need seven to nine hours. My little aura ring tells me that I average around seven and a half. Um, and that seems to be the right number for me. Seven and a half is great though, right? Because REM yeah. cycles are 90 minutes. That's five REM cycles. You know, it sounds, it sounds good. That's a responsible amount of sleep. You know, I feel, but what's crazy is when you think about eight hours, eight hours, a third of your day, you're sleeping. But you're so much more productive when you sleep. Yeah, you get you wake up. You're, right. you're right. You're right. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm in such a better mood. Right. I'm right. such a better mood. All right. Sleep. Sleep is sleep is underrated. We don't get enough of. It. We just scroll the internet for like four hours a night, and then we stay up till midnight, and it's like silly. Yeah. yeah. All right. Good one. You're two for two. You're you're nailing it. All right. Number three here. Most DE, <laughs> most DE and I initiatives. Oh Ooh, God, go. overrated, 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 overrated. Oh, overrated. Oh my gosh, I love the hot take. Okay, tell me why. Overrated? No, because for the reasons I said before, you know, we just need to be kind of putting a little pause on some of these DEI initiatives, and I think focus on the cultural agility training instead, things that just help us just have natural, comfortable conversations with one another, where we sort of have this healthy respect that we've all been socialized differently. And we come to the world seeing, you know, situations differently based on how we've been socialized. And this isn't a function of demography, usually. It's usually a function of lots of this, lots of it kind of piled onto each other. And that, you know, hey, it makes us who we are. And we just have to get comfortable having conversations that are more, that are, you know, not, I don't know. I just don't like bias training. Yeah. You have a bias against bias training. I have a bias. I am, I am biased. <laughs> That's just because you have a lot of data in your brain and you're making quick decisions based on that data. Um, you know, this is a really tough one, right? 
I mean, it's so charged, right? Um, I think it's, I, I, I think you make a lot of sense in what you're saying. Um, I also, you know, I, I guess I haven't worked at a big company in a long time, so I don't, I don't know what the bias, you know, unconscious bias training feels like to go through it. I kind of get it conceptually. Um, I do think we have a long way to go still in our understanding of one another. And I do feel that we make snap judgments that well, may or may not be correct. Right. And I, and I think that we do ourselves a disservice when they're not correct, but, um, so, you know, I don't, I don't know. This is a tough one. And I always, I want always... to give up the training. I don't want to throw the baby out of bed. I, what I want to do is get us off of sort of calling everyone biased because we are, we, our brains are, our brains are biased based on the data that we've been storing. What I want to do is get us off of that. So yes, of course, everybody, yep. Congratulations, you're biased. Yeah. And then move on to how do we have comfortable conversations with one another? That takes some competencies. And that's what I, that's just, that's the pivot yeah. that I want us to make. I don't I like I just, that approach. I don't want to just focus on the one thing. I don't want to deny that those challenges exist. Of course they do. Right. Of course they do for lots of people, you know, there's a lot of yeah. discrimination out there, but, but it doesn't mean we can't get better at it. And I just, I want to do the things that matter and do the things that are working. All right, you make a you make a good case. You make a good case. I'll I'll, I'll give you the point on that one. That was a tough one. Woo! All right, number four. Remote work on corporate culture. The impact and the impact of remote work on co yeah. corporate culture. Yeah, yeah. I I oh, think people are underrating how much damage remote work, fully remote organizations are having on their long term corporate culture. I get a lot of clients that call and say. You know, yeah, we're trying to do some org culture work. And then when you really talk about it, remember, culture is socialized. It's what we learn from one another. It's what when people who have longer tenure in an organization say, oh, yeah, here's how we do it here. When someone socializes you and here's the right way or the wrong way to think about, you know, decisions. That's how that's how culture is transmitted. Yeah. You can't read about it. You can't zoom about it. It's 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 person to person. So I think we're, we're really, you know, under, under, under guessing, under rating, um, how under much valuing. under yeah. valuing how much, or how much damage remote work is doing on corporate culture. Now I don't think it has to be, you know, seven days or five days a week, whatever. Seven days um, a week is that the like, skill? Five hours, like, seven days. <laughs> I'm like torture over here, but um, but yeah, I don't think it has to be permanent. I just think we have to be a little more, a little more um, deliberate to now. You know, creation of corporate culture. Yeah, talk about the pendulum swinging, right? Back and forth, right? So it's like COVID hits, boom, we're 100 percent remote. Everybody is right, and then and then now you see it kind of coming back, and you're seeing a lot of a lot of friction, right? You're seeing workforces that don't want to come back. You're seeing you're seeing employers that say, you know, you have to, right? And and are feeling that that like what you're saying that they're feeling the, the, the culture, the performance of the company suffering. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's really really fascinating. Um, but remote, but don't you think that I mean remote work can also be you know people sitting in their cubicle with a headset on, not interacting with anyone any day. Well, what's the point of coming all the way into an office if you're just going to put a headset on and not talk to anyone every day? That that's also not socialization. That's not old culture. You know, we need yeah. even if it's a day a week, you need some amount of time to actually have you know, the ability to, to transmit culture to one another, communicate. Yeah, I, I like it. I mean, I, we're, we're, we're building a, a culture here, you know, and it, and it does involve people being in the office, although we do have people that, that are fully remote and flourishing, you know, so it's, it's hard to say, right. Cause you don't want to demonize the people that aren't, that aren't there. Right. But I mean, there is some proximity bias too, yeah. that exists, right. When, when you're in the same building with people and you just see each other and just start things pop in your head, right? You don't want to schedule a Zoom meeting to discuss it, but if I catch in the break room or in passing, I might mention it to you, you know, and, and things like that. And the osmosis is a lot more natural that way. So I think so you're it's totally how right. It's how trust is built, right? Proximity, frequency, duration. That's all the like the ways that we, when we connect. Is that right? Proximity, frequency, frequency duration? duration. Yeah. Dropping yeah. gems. Okay. All right. You definitely get a point. <laughs> Definitely get a point for that proximity, frequency, and duration. Um, PFD. All right. Got it. Uh, all right. Next one. Last one here. 
Game nights with friends. We like oh, games. Oh, definitely underrated. You definitely need to have spend more time having playing games. Put away the phones. I actually have a basket when I have friends over. Um, we have a basket. We collect phones. <laughs> oh, wow. It sounds like an exciting. Yeah. I know. I'm really, I'm terrible. It's one of those. All right. Okay. I, am, I am a horrible human. We just um, have yeah, good time. No, I no, I love it. I'm sure honestly, when you disengage, like even me, I have my phone like over here, like, like adjacent. People say, like, even when it's like in the same room, it like becomes like it, it pulls your attention, you know. Um what what game? What game are you playing? What's the go-to? What's the okay? Depends one? on the friends. So there's some friends who are like, you know, okay, cards against humanity kind of yeah, crazy, <laughs> kind of friends. crazy friends. Okay, yeah, the tequila, friends. The tequila set. Like, <laughs> like the rummy cube scrabble kinds of friends. Yeah. There's yeah. Depends on depends on the group. I like it. Okay, yeah, cool, cool. Yeah. No, I, I was just thinking this. You know, you're you're 100. percent You went five for five. You you went a perfect five for five. Honestly, Paula, <laughs> it's 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 hard to do, especially with curveballs coming at you left and right. So that's uh fantastic here. Um, this is this has been great. Uh, what's um, what's one thing I just want to ask you to? I know we're running out of time here, but leave us maybe just with a final thought, Paula. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'd say, you know, Hey, look at, especially for the relocation, the mobility folks that are listening to this, please, your roles are so critical in helping usher individuals into being great at this. And we need more people out there who are culturally agile. So, so keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Paula Caligiuri here from Skillify, also a professor at Northeastern, I believe. Yes. Yes. All right. Wonderful. And uh, bringing us the physiology uh, of, <laughs> of global mobility, as well as cultural agility. Super cool topic. Thanks, everybody, for joining in today. Hit that like button one more time. Uh, give Paula a shout out and definitely follow her on LinkedIn and the other socials and whatnot. So uh, thanks, Paula. Thanks for being here. Appreciate you.